Well, you guys know anytime you break out the old boomer chair, it's going to be one of those videos, right? So if you're looking for regular automotive content, click away now. Come back to the next video. We'll have that for you. But for right now, there's some other stuff I want to get into. And I want to go back to that video we did about three weeks ago on that 2018 F-150. It had some water getting a taillight lens, which caused a chain reaction through the CAN bus system that basically bricked the truck and ended up netting a $5,600 repair. Insanity, right? Now, it's an extreme example, but it's something that's happening more and more and more. Parts that are unserviceable, systems that are unserviceable by the average mechanic that don't make sense. So as I was going through the comments on the video, I realized a couple of things. The first is that the vast majority of people agree with that basic sentiment. There were over 5,000 comments on that video so far. The vast majority agreed with that basic sentiment. There were a few people who were like, oh no, that's just the way it is now, you know, get used to it, boomer, you know, your, your ways are done. You know, and okay, I can kind of respect that perspective, but you know, it kind of just tells me that you really haven't been around that long or you don't really see the bigger picture, but it's okay. And there was another big segment of the population in the comments that were like, yeah, I agree. Because we talked about how at some point we're going to have to go Cuban on these things. And because we're hot rodders and mechanics and everything, we're used to building cars. We could build cars from scratch. So it wouldn't be that big of a deal to take a late model car that's got, has had an electronic freak out and replaced engine transmission, all of the computer control bits with user-friendly, more analog and traditional components and motor down the road. And a lot of guys were like, yeah, that's a great idea. I know we could do that, but they won't let us. The laws, you know, anti-tampering laws, inspection laws, and so on and so forth. And that's what I want to get to at the end of this video, because there's a bigger picture to all this that I don't think a lot of you guys are seeing. But let's, let's step back and let's talk about when I feel or when I, when I discovered that this was kind of deliberate and we were screwed. All right. So... All right, well, let's go even further back than that. Let's talk about the history of the automobile, the American automobile. And you go back to the Model T. So the Model T was the first commercial success. They sold over 50 million of these things. And it was the template for the American car and American automotive manufacturing going forward. So one of the key selling points, one of the key features of the Model T was how serviceable it was. It was durable, it was serviceable, it was simple. The average person using average hand tools, using easily acquired or even fabricated parts, could service these things and keep them on the road indefinitely. This was a key selling feature. The cars were designed with this in mind and they were sold with that feature. Automotive evolution took us to a different place. And I know exactly where it started. I know exactly the turning point, And I know exactly where I realized, okay, they're out to get us. So that basic ideal of user serviceability stayed constant through the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and into the early part of the 70s, where cars were designed so that simple, the, you know, the basic maintenance on them could be performed by the average person. So the average guy, if he wanted to, could give it a tune-up, could change the belts, could change the hoses, could flush the cooling system, uh, oil changes, of course, lubrication, they could do brakes. You know, all of these things were commonly done by, you know, guys. Typical, you know, you don't have to be a mechanic to do these things. You just have to have basic mechanical sense and some hand tools, and you could do the maintenance on your car. But that started to change in the 70s. Now, some people can argue that, well, cars started to become more complicated because of emission requirements and fuel economy requirements and so on and so forth. And there is something to be said for that. But I can point out deliberate things that were done to foul up the average mechanic to make the cars more and more unserviceable. So in the very early 1980s, fuel injection started to work its way into well, actually in the late 70s, but by the early 80s, fuel injection had pretty much become the thing. And as mechanics working with this stuff, we became familiar with it fairly quickly. So we could diagnose and we could work on fuel injection systems. We didn't need the factory. There was, there was nothing, 
it was not proprietary really. It was all pretty much common sense. Still along the lines of the analog kind of machine that we were used to. But they started doing things to make it more and more difficult, like deliberately difficult. And an example of this is with the EFI came in-tank mounted fuel pumps. Now, in-tank mounted pumps, electric pumps, have been around for a long time. And if you go back to cars from the 70s and a lot of foreign cars, whenever there was a, uh, a tank mounted fuel pump, there would always be an access door. There'd always be an access panel. You know, you'd open the trunk, you'd pull away a piece of carpet or whatever, and there'd be a panel. You'd take the panel off and there's the pump, the pump assembly, the top of the tank, and you could just service it. But when mainstream American cars adopted EFI and in-tank mounted pumps, they didn't give us any of those things. They didn't give us any trap doors. In order to get, the, get to the pump, which is a normal service item, it's not like it's something that's supposed to last the life of a car, the fuel pumps go bad. So in order to get to this pump, there were no easy access panels. You actually had to drop the tank out of the car. Could they have given us a drain plug? No, no drain plug and no access panel. If you wanted to service a typical car, you had to take the tank out of the car. How do you drain the tank? You can't siphon them anymore, you know, through the filler neck because they put anti-check valves in there, anti-siphon check valves in there. So what do you do? Half a tank, full tank, right? 16 gallons of gas. You've got to wrestle this tank down and somehow or another get the gas out of it so it can be handled. It was a dangerous situation. I can remember many times doing this sort of work where I felt like I was in danger. There was just, it was just a little too chaotic. There was a little too much gas around. There was too many, too many puddles and too much drippage. And it's like anything could set this off. This is dangerous. But you know, you deal with it. You just go with it and you deal with it and you work with the stuff. And then I had a, there was a, there was a service station. It was like a three base service station that was on the corner of Arthur Kill Road and uh, Armstrong Avenue on Staten Island, in my neighborhood. And it was in the same shopping center as the parts store that I used to buy my parts from, preferred. And uh, I walked into a parts store one morning and they're like, man, did you see what happened at the station? I says, no. He says, oh, they would, they would drop a tank out of a car and I guess a drop light fell and broke. It was an explosion and it killed all three people in the shop. You know, and it went by there and the place was still smoldering. And that's what happened. They had a tank. I guess it was full or close to full and they were wrestling it out and maybe i don't know maybe somebody slipped or whatever happened but a drop light broke when the drop light broke the gas ignited and pff, that was it three people killed and I, i'm sure you've heard similar stories because that wasn't the only one that i heard about that one that one hit close to home because you know it was close to home but it was a dangerous situation and it was like done deliberately it was a deliberate oversight it was done to make that, along with many other things, was done to make it that much more difficult to service these cars once they left the warranty period. You know, so you got 70,000 miles, 80, 100,000 miles, and then these things start to go bad. We're not going back to the dealership. They're going to the regular mechanic. And if the regular mechanic wants to fix this stuff, go ahead, fight through this obstacle. And they kept throwing these obstacles. Then about the same time, and this was a General Motors application, and I don't remember specifically what it was. I don't remember the model or the year, but I remember very specifically it was a General Motors thing. Up to this point, when the fuel pump would go bad, you'd just change the pump. It, it rode in a canister, and the canister would usually contain the fuel sending switch or the fuel sending unit and the pump and the strainer. And you would change the pump and the strainer and put it back together again. And I remember doing one of these jobs and got the tank out and I went to take the fuel lines off the top of the, the housing and they wouldn't come off. And I remember spending like an hour trying to figure out how to get, what the hell was going on? How do you get these lines off? Screwing around, messing around. So finally I called a friend of mine who works at the dealer. I says, what's going on with this? He says, oh, you just got to break that. He says, no, it's not a serviceable item. You just got to break, break the, the, the line off, the plastic line, and then you can pull it out of the fuel line. Why? They made it so that you couldn't just change the pump. You had to change the entire canister with all of these things in there. So it went from like a, a $50, you know, $40, $50 pump 
to an entire assembly, which at the time they were going for like two and three hundred dollars, which was a big chunk of change at the time for that type of part. They're screwing us. They're screwing us, right? And then we get to the 4.0. And I did a whole video on the 4.0. This is the overhead cam Ford 4.0. And I had, actually, I had a 92 Ranger with a pushrod 4.0. And it was a fantastic engine. This, this engine had been in, in production since, like, the middle 1960s. They built millions and millions of them, the pushrod version. And then in 1997, Ford said, you know what? We're going to go with overhead cams on this thing. It's going to be an overhead cam engine. So they did that. They refigured, they reconfigured the engine, and they added overhead cams, and a, a, an insane timing chain set up. So you had the main timing chain with a jack shaft, and then you had uh, one timing chain went to the front cylinder head or the the driver's side cylinder head, and at the back of the engine, had another timing chain going to the passenger side cam. It was insanity. It was insanity, right? What was the reason for this? Why would you do this? Would you, did you go to overhead cams to increase the RPM potential of this engine? No. This new engine operates in the same exact RPM range as the old one. Are you saving that much weight by getting rid of push rods to make it worthwhile? Well, that's not possible because look at all of these other things that need to be turned in order to... So you're actually increasing your parasitic losses. You're making the engine less efficient by going to these overhead cams. Why did they go to this overhead cam setup? It made no sense. They took an engine that had been established and around for years and functioned beautifully and changed it to be a bomb, literally a time bomb. And at a, about 100,000 miles, the chain tensioners would all start to go away. They'd, they'd break. Now, in order to do this job, you've literally got to take the engine out of the truck because you can't change the timing chain on the passenger side with the engine in the truck. It has to be accessed from inside the bell housing. There's a bolt inside the bell housing that has to be pulled out. So the motor's got to come out. All right, this is all bad enough, right? And I had, I had done three of these, and it was the first one that I did that made me realize they were deliberately out to get us. They're deliberately trying to put us out of business. Because forget about the, all of this nonsensical overcomplication that makes this thing really unsurvivable without a major overhaul at about the 100,000 mile mark. Forget about all of that. Now, if you're familiar with this job, you'll know what I'm talking about. And if you're not familiar with this job, you can Google it and you'll see what I'm talking about. On the driver's side timing chain, there's what they call a cassette. And the cassette is the guide assembly, right? So the cassette is the guide and the, the chain. The cassette is held in place with one bolt. You have to take the timing cover off and the bolt that holds it in place, the pivot bolt, is under there. When you take this pivot bolt out, you would think that you can take the guides, the, the cassette, out through the top because it's just it's wide open up there. You've got the valve cover off, right? You've got the timing gear off. You've got the chain out of the way. You would think that you could take these guides and just pull them out of the top. That would be the common sense thing to do. But you can't. You can't. Because when you take that bolt out, there's like a pivot piece in there, and that pivot piece is about a quarter of an inch too wide, even less, to fit through the opening. You can't pull it up through the top. You can finagle it and wiggle it and push it and do all kinds of things. And it'll almost come, but not quite. There's about a quarter of an inch interference there. I ended up, the first time I did this, I took the head off. Take the head off and pull it out from the bottom. To do a timing chain job? To do a timing chain job? Engine out and I gotta pull heads? All right, I found out later on that the right way to do this job is to bend that piece that actually, you know, distort it so it'll fit through the opening. But, you know, as a mechanic in that day, in that era, you didn't think to do stuff like that. You know, you look for the procedure to take it apart. You weren't bending things and destroying things, distorting things to take them apart, right? There was a procedure, there was always a procedure. Sometimes it was simple, sometimes it was very complicated, but there was always a procedure. For this one, there was no procedure. The right way to do it, or the, the only way to do it, and get it out through the top without taking a head off was to bend it and, and, all right. So now, this is how I knew we were screwed. This is where I knew we were screwed, because the engineers knew this. This assembly has to be taken apart, the engines, before it goes into production, the engine has to be assembled and taken apart and each step documented. That's how you do the service manuals. 
So they knew that this was ridiculous. There was no reason they couldn't create that space, just a little bit of space for that thing to fit through. Nothing in the way. They made it deliberately difficult. To add insult to injury, when you buy the replacement one, it comes in two pieces. So that you can actually pull a clip out, put the two pieces in through the top, and then assemble the clip and assemble them once it's in place. So it's something that was done deliberately to foul up the mechanic. It was like, how dare you try to keep this thing going instead of letting the customer junk it and go buy one of our new cars. It was like, it was a gotcha. It was a deliberate gotcha. And I had to fight anybody to tell me that that's not the reason that they did it. Because it made no sense. And that's when I realized, as mechanics, we were screwed. That the manufacturers didn't want us messing with their stuff. And if we were going to mess with their stuff, we were going to pay for it. All right. So, let's talk about where we are now and the future. And I'm going to get into something that's a little controversial. So, there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about in this channel, but I can't. I can't because I love YouTube. YouTube has been great to me. Um, it, it's given me incredible opportunities. I love this platform that we have, and I don't want to risk it. And the problem with speaking about certain topics, speaking about certain things in today's world is that YouTube doesn't like it. So I have to be very careful about what I talk about. I have to be very careful about things that I go into. So if I'm vague, I'm being deliberately vague, and maybe you just got to read between the lines and maybe do a little research on your own. So I said that we, at some point, probably sooner rather than later, are going to start having to get Cuban with these cars. And a lot of you guys are like, well, there's laws. You know, they'll come and get you. They'll put you in jail for working on these things, for modifying and so on and so forth. I got to tell you guys, I wouldn't worry about that. We're at a very unique period in history right now. And it has to do with a portion of the government. And now I'm not talking about parties. I'm not talking about Republicans and Democrats and all that nonsense, because that's all nonsense. I'm talking about stuff that happens at a deeper level. And this is not conspiracy, okay? I mean, you could choose to not believe me, or you can do your own research and find these facts on your own, all right? So I'm not going to tell you what to believe. I'm just going to tell you where to look, all right? What we're experiencing right now, this overall insanity, and you see this insanity everywhere. You see it in the economy, you see it in, in government, you see it in media, you see it everywhere. The insanity that we're seeing right now is a bankruptcy. And it's a bankruptcy that started in 2008, the GFC, the Great Financial Crisis. I mean, there were steps that led to this. But beginning in 2008, basically, all of the normal, uh, well, let's say, let's say uh, constraints, all of the normal laws, all the normal regulations, gone, forgotten about. And... Not that they were really that effective at that period of time, but gone. And right now we're at 33, is it? $33 trillion in debt. And just day before yesterday, actually, the, the, the Bank of International Settlements came out and warned about a one quadrillion dollar derivative time bomb hanging over. This is the Bank of International Settlements. This isn't Tony, this isn't some conspiracy site. This is the Bank of International Settlements saying, admitting now that there's a quadrillion dollars worth of derivatives that are like a time bomb on top of hundreds of trillion dollars worth of unfunded liabilities. This is why things are as crazy as they are. And here's the part that you, you, you may want to do a little research and you may want to look into. Now, this is what I learned about 25 years ago. And and so I, this is not new to me. This isn't just something that happened that, you know, I read about on some, you know, this, this is the truth. This is the truth. So you've got the Constitutional Republic, 1776, the one that we all know about. And you pledge an allegiance to the flag, right? That's the Constitutional Republic. But there's a corporate entity involved in the government that 
began in 1871, that was founded in 1871. And it is also the United States government, but it's not the constitutional government, it's the corporate government. Now, if you've ever wondered about certain things, so if you ever wondered why your name is spelled in certain ways, certain capitalizations and in certain orders, you know, last name first and just this part capitalized or in all caps, okay? If you ever wondered about why that was, look into it, okay? If you ever wondered what your birth certificate represented, look into it, okay? Um, all of these things have to do with the corporation and the banking system, the, the, uh, the Federal Reserve. Here are some key dates. I'm just going to throw the years out, and then you can do some research, and you see where these dates all tie together, okay? 1865, 1871, 1913, 1933, 1964. Oh, I'm sorry, 1947. 1964, 1971, 1980. Each of those are pivotal dates in the evolution of this corporate government. Well, that corporation is bankrupt. That corporation is what all of those agencies, those boogeyman agencies, are part of. So the, the EPA and, and OSHA and, uh, uh, I mean, it just, just, they're all part of the corporation. They're all part of the corporation. They're bankrupt. They're bankrupt. We're in the middle of that bankruptcy proceeding. It's a global thing. It's not going to happen in the blink of an eye. It's been happening. It'll continue to happen. Things are weird now, and they're going to get weirder. They're going to get much weirder as this is all unwound. It's going to take between three and seven years or thereabouts before we come out the other side and like a new normal exists. And that new normal is going to be a reconstruction of our American infrastructure, our uh, American manufacturing base. You know, I mean, you realize we have enough fuel in the United States. We own enough fuel, oil, natural gas, coal, to keep us going at our current rate of consumption for the next 300 years. But we can't touch it. We can't use it. We are forced through these corporate ties to buy it from foreign entities. This is stuff they don't teach you in school. And nothing that I'm telling you right now is even remotely conspiratorial. What I'm telling you is the absolute truth. These are facts and you can find them yourself if you choose to go looking for them. And then feel free to connect dots and associate them to whichever conspiracy you feel you know best with. But whatever I'm telling you right now is not conspiracy. You can look these things up, and this is what's going on. So, the moral of the story is, things are weird. They're going to get weirder. Things are crazy. They're going to get crazier. The things that you're afraid of are paper tigers. They have no bite. They have no horsepower. They have no future, right? Plan accordingly. Stock up. Stock up on parts. Stock up on tools. Hone your skills. This is going to be a great time. When we come out the other end of this, yeah, there's going to be a lot of ugliness. There's going to be a lot of ugliness, okay? A lot of ugliness. But trust me when I tell you, when we come out through the other side of all of this, you're going to be happy. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Right? All right, so I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going on for like 25 minutes now. I hope you got something out of that. Again, don't take my word for anything I said. Look into it for yourself, right? And connect the dots yourself. Education is everything. You know, you're a gearhead. You wouldn't be watching this channel if you weren't like a gearhead, right? We're gearheads because we're problem solvers. You know, we identify a problem. We fix the problem, right? This is what we do. You know what I mean? We're wired for that. That's, that's why we're all collective. That's why we're, we're in this collective together. These are problems. You've, you've got problems in all aspects of society, the economy, 
Find the problem, fix the problem, reap the rewards. I'll see you tomorrow.